morning, everybody. This is House Ways and Means. It's February 24th. And um, this is Thursday, so we're going to talk about Ed Finance. Uh, uh, we're going to spend the first couple hours on that. And we are going to spend a little time on the proposal to move to income, so based income uh, system. And then later this morning, we're going to take up S169. Uh, which is a fairly uh, narrow uh, bill dealing with property tax overpayments. Um, so before we get started, and I give this over to Emily, if anybody have any questions or concerns? Do we have a bill on the floor today? I don't Never. think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it was on notice yesterday, but I think. It's, no, it's appropriation. Eight six ninety seven, and it and the uh, current use bill is on notice, and the other bill that we did is in the appropriations committee. So, um, and uh, also to tell the committee that the letter that we talked about, um, we all got copies of it before it went up to appropriations, but it was um, along. I don't think there was anything different than what we had discussed. So, uh, so with that. It's all yours. Thanks. Um, so we've spent, well, however many weeks we've all been in session, I really have no idea anymore. Um, but we've been going sort of back and forth through each week. What? Each week. Thank you. You're always there for the number. Whenever a number is needed, thank you, Scott. Um, so we've spent eight weeks sort of going through the different pieces of the task force's recommendations from the summer. And we've done a deep dive on a few of them. And I thought before we get to crossover week, it would be helpful to sort of go through them again and just hear from folks on where you feel more comfortable and where you still have questions, not making any sort of decisions, but almost sort of a, just a check-in to see where more content is needed. Um, and so Catherine is here to help with that. And there is just to have an object for us to look at. Um, I trimmed up the PowerPoint that um, Ruth and I went through seven weeks ago, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, so that we can just use that as a tool to sort of talk through what the recommendations are and where people um, might have forgotten that we ever talked about it or to flag that we still haven't talked about it or whatever that is. And then we're gonna totally pivot and talk about the um, income-based education funding proposal with Abby. So, Catherine, I did not show you that PowerPoint before you walked no, in the door, so I'm I sorry. Okay. Um, and so it was my PowerPoint, not Catherine's, but she's gonna, um, it's just a way to organize the conversation. And so did you just wanna start with the, at the top of it? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah. The yeah. choice about um, weights and categorical payments. So I, I have done slide three. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are similar. These are all using the same, if you remember, using the same, uh, Tammy Colby report numbers. There are two different ways to administer them. And I, um, I'm afraid I don't know exactly what everything that you discussed on these yeah. topics. But I, don't, I think the question that uh, Representative Cornhead has is obviously what other information do you need about thinking about waste versus categorical waste? And so can you speak up? Oh, I think I think the sound. There's a lot of sound right oh, yeah. going on over here. Sure. Um, so the. Weights versus cost. And I can't turn the volume up. <laughs> yeah, no. Weights yes. versus cost equity. And I think the question for you all is you've heard some information about it. Is there additional information you would like as you think through the trade offs between those two uh, numbers? Those numbers are the, both of them are based on the memo from the Tammy Colby. Uh, was it January? Sometime first part of January. First part of January. Which is, so they're, they're meant to be, reflect the same um, inputs, I guess, the question is how do you administer? Yeah. <laughs> and Representative Cornish, is that what you were thinking? We're talking yeah, about so other information that people need on the on when you think about those two options. Um, and so I would go, 
the first question is, does everyone feel like you have your head around how the cost equity proposal works? Um, and then there's just a conversation about pros and cons. Oh, hello, George's dog. Um, <laughs> Or do folks want to have some time at a future date to have more conversation about how cost equity works? Jim? I could have just a simple refresher and how it works. I mean, I think it would be good to mm -hmm. recalibrate my perspective. Oh. So the do you want to try that really quick now, Justin? Is it what you're asking for that right now, Jim? Um, when it works best, okay. how we're working forward with this. Okay, stop. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's an interesting thing going on. There, there. <laughs> I can't see I'm myself sorry. on my you know, square, but anyway. Mm -hmm. We're sort of all used to looking in a mirror all the time. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Catherine, do you want to explain sort of quickly how the cost equity works? Sure. So in, instead of having weighted students, we have a, a dollar amount per pupil that would go to the school, to the district based on um, we have a dollar amount assigned to poverty, we have a dollar amount assigned to I'm trying to think of the secondary. There's a whole string of weights, but not weights, but that's apparently the cost equity is translated in, as a translation from weights into a direct payment to schools. Um, that's a simple explanation. I don't, um, it obviously has other implications about how it rolls out, what, oh, how it, how it gets That's used. a good start. Okay. And so on the next slide, which is slide four, sorry, not that one. On slide three, it sort of lifts what those factors are. The students living in poverty, the middle and high school students, the small schools, and the sparse districts. We had conversations last year about why those factors were chosen and how those factors were measured. Is there anything about those four factors that are used for cost adjustment that people still want to dive into? Yeah. I still want English language learners to be have their own bullet point here, but that might be a conversation for later. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm the um, the number that was recommended for ELL and the on a pre pupil on a student basis and the costs that uh, we had at least one school district Winooski revealed to us their ELL costs on a pupil basis. Those two numbers are like not even in the same hemisphere. And I'd like to, one's about 7,500 and the other is like 27,000. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I still have some questions about what the right number is there. So, but for students living in poverty, for middle and high school students, with, for small school students, and for sparse districts and the cutoffs for sparse districts, are there other, yeah, Tara? Well, following along um, that line of thinking, did, I guess we might want to have testimony about how much people are spending on middle school, high school, small schools, sparse schools, poverty, so I, that we... I think there's two different questions out here. <laughs> <laughs> You want to finish your thought, Carl? Yeah, because if if we're going to go based on what Winooski said, then I guess we need to know what if if any decision that we make is based on that one piece of information, then I guess I would need to see that piece of information for each of those other things. We that's not information that can be picked out of a budget. So do, um, I wouldn't think so. So I don't know how, how this one person who said one thing once is That one person was the Winooski superintendent. Let's, let's put ELL aside for now. Um, the way that 
the other weights or cost equity payments, sort of the determination of those. That seems like no one has for is feeling like you, if we somehow had made all the other decisions, those pieces, do those pieces feel solid to you now? Or do you, does anyone want to dive in deeper at another point on this? I'm Stop. comfortable. I'm comfortable with those pieces. Okay. Thank you. Can you re restate that? I'm not sure I understand. So which. the sort of weights or payment determinations for students living in poverty, the idea of weighting middle and high school students more, that we weight small schools with fewer than 250 and fewer than 100 students differently, and that we um, adjust costs or adjust values for sparse school districts. Yeah, I, I had mentioned this to a couple of people. Yeah, and I've asked Brad actually if he would uh, yes. respond to a, a, just a question I had about the middle and high school students, the grade level weights, and whether in the grand scheme of things, under, recognizing that it does in fact cost more, uh, accepting that it does cost more to educate those students, whether it was really necessary to have those weights given that all Vermonters have a, a, a single blended tax rate that reflects a K through 12 student population and that across time and across districts, there shouldn't really be a lot of variance from one district to the other on the makeup of that student population. So, which is not to say that, again, it's not to say that it doesn't cost more to educate the upper grades and that in some towns, there's gonna be, you know, from one year to the next, a lower population of kindergartners or of 12th graders. But given that we're looking at a fairly significant impact on in, in the cost equity uh, category, if we went that direction and we're talking about moving money, um, just looking at that weight, it, it's quite a big chunk of it. So anyway, there's a, a question I did ask Brad about and he has uh, agreed to give it some thought. The way I think about what you, when you said it to me first was just that like all of those kids will eventually be or once young and will eventually be, I mean, for the, you know, for the most part, God willing, um, right. will eventually right. be older and it's sort of an interesting thing how it adjusts. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, done. I'm shifting gears off that. Did you, are you responding to that? I, I can respond directly to David. I'm not sure what you care. Um, I get your point. It is a blended tax rate. I think the, the problem becomes though, is that when you have, let's say you have, for example, and we do elementary school districts in the state of Vermont, and then we have you know, high school district. And yes, their their rates are blended, but it if you don't if you don't give them any uh, weighting or um, a cost equity, um, their pupil spending that they're showing voters starts to starts to separate, and I think that from is a, it it provides a difficult narrative and a difficult perspective for the voters. Like, how come this district is spending? 15,000 and this district is spending 18,000 and I'm paying taxes for both of them. And I think it, it kind of, it causes that problem. Yeah, I think that's true. Def definitely. And uh, it would probably, it, in the same way that if the weights aren't correct today, it's forcing, putting pressure on decisions, you know, in, in a direction one way or the other. And so, so agreed. Yeah, that, that is definitely a, a concern if we didn't have that, that way, but on the other hand, I guess I'm putting it out there. What are we really getting? What what is it? Does it really that? So that's what we're getting. And is there a a cost also to having this this weight either in distortion, um, one way or the other, just putting more money into the system, possibly increasing spending overall? Yeah, I think I think what you're getting is, is putting every district on a level playing field. That's what you're getting. Yeah. So did you have something in the I just, middle? I, I didn't understand the question. I just, I, I need to understand what you're asking. So, well, I, so very basically the question is, do you need to have a grade, grade level weight, weights? Oh, okay. And then I understood the answer, so, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, uh, actually, one, just a thought about that conversation, which is interesting, is as we've moved to unified unions, don't, how many, uh, school districts that we have with its own 
uh, tax rate that's only elementary school or only high school. It does, I don't need an answer. It just it seems that that's fewer and fewer. I mean, it used to be like we used to have a K six in Dallas. We don't now. We're part of this uh, unified union, much to our DNA. <laughs> so uh, our we have one tax rate that that's adjusted by the CLA, but it's the same for all the towns. Anyway, that was just a question. I, I had something else I was going to ask, mm -hmm. and it's just I I um I don't I don't think I've ever understood the sparsity weight and the small school discussion. And I don't know that I need to have it all here, but it feels to me that those are mm -hmm. doing similar but not the same thing. And I'm, I, if we're going to actually implement this sooner than later, I'd like to understand whether we're overcounting or undercounting somehow or um, that uh, impact. And I know people have spent lots of time thinking about it, so mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not questioning the validity of it, but I, at some point I need to understand those better because those always feel to me to be kind of similar. Mm -hmm. So, Jen, are you saying you don't understand what the weights are doing or what the relative impact of well, if you have older, you have students? a weight for small schools and you have a weight for sparsity and, right. I, and clearly uh, there are schools that are going to fall into both categories. Um, they're going to be small <coughs> and it's mm -hmm. going to be sparse. And I'm gotcha. trying to understand what the why we have both and what we're counting with one that we're not counting in the other. Mm -hmm. And just sort of a detail of it that I forget sometimes is that you can only have the small school weight if you're in a sparse district. So it's an if then um, is how it felt. So we can dive okay. deeper into that yeah. one. Thank you. I just haven't, I, I know the discussions have happened, but I haven't so, listened closely. Yeah. <laughs> so. so you've got the bullets here, small schools, mm -hmm. fewer than 250 or 100. And then the sparse schools, are you lumping those together now? So the way it, Catherine, do you want to explain it? No, okay, great. Okay, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's a great question. Yeah. So the idea is that there's um, a weight for, a specific weight for a school that's less than 250 students, and then a bigger weight for a school that's less than 100 students. And similarly, there's a weight for, there are three different weights that get progressively larger for a density of 100 students per square, 100 people per square mile, 55 people per square mile, and 36 people per square mile. And so it's essentially five different weights that we're looking at there. What happens is you only get that small school weight if your school is getting the sparsity weight. So if your school has the sparsity weight and you have a small school in that sparse district, then you get um, the small school, one of those two small school weights. Um, I, it's one of those things that I think a flow chart just makes it easier to okay. understand what I'm saying out loud because it's a um, contingencies, but does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, the part of it that, and I think about explaining this to mm -hmm. people, the part of it that doesn't make sense is mm -hmm. to do it in two steps, you mm -hmm. know, that it, it, so yeah. if you're trying to explain to mm -hmm. somebody how this works, mm -hmm. I don't think people are going to get it. Yeah, one, the way I think about it is that um, there were these huge debates about geographically necessary small schools that got, um, there's a really fun memo from AOE from um, State Board of Ed folks about how possible it was for them to determine that. Right. And this is sort of a statistical method for determine, determining a geographically necessary small school. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the way that I am thinking about it right now, not necessarily the way I have been, is that if, if you are in a, an urban or a, a population dense district and you have a series of small schools, that's a choice that you're making as opposed to if you're in a, uh, a more rural area where there just aren't a lot of students and you your small school is small by necessity. I think that's a valid way to look at it. I also think that what the study authors are saying is that they saw an effect of the different of the relationship between 
dollars spent on educational outcomes in these categories. Yeah, they and they didn't yeah, right. see them in those other categories. Otherwise it would have modeled that way. I hate to say this, but can you repeat that again? I want to make sure I got that. Yeah, and so Tammy's coming um, in in two, two weeks? Something like the that. Ten. Ten. Um, those and so she'll do some work talking about that, but the idea is that what the study authors found is that there was a statistical relationship between dollars spent and educational outcomes for kids in those particular categories of lived experience for those students that they didn't necessarily see in other places. Of dollars spent and outcomes. The relationship between dollars spent and outcomes. Okay. Thank and so any of the weights, the idea is that there was a relationship between dollars spent, more dollars spent and better outcomes. And that's how the weights or the cost equity payments. Um, I'm going to try to use, say, cost adjustment as a way of describing the weights or the cost equity, just so I don't have to use six words each time. What are you going to say? Cost <laughs> adjustment, but it's. I'm just going to try it on today, see how it feels. <clears throat> So what I hear from folks is that folks are good with the students living in poverty in terms of like sort of getting your head around it, but there are still questions about weights for different ages or of kids, and there's still a few more questions about the rural and sparsity. Yeah. And then I would have to say, I, I don't, I can't remember how this turned out, but if we're going to rely on what a Winooski superintendent once said. I don't know the context of that. I don't know what was in addition to some other money. I don't know anything about that. So for that to hold water for me, I would have to hear from that again. And I'd have to hear about all the other things that are spent. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll, um, okay. I'll send that testimony to sources so she can show okay. this to kids. And we'll spend a lot more time on ELL, as will the Education committee. Okay. So next slide. And I, can I just yes, ask please. The, the representative asked this question. I think it's, it's understanding it, but also I think explaining it and that when you, when you have a summary, explaining the nuances of it a little bit more clearly so that it's clear who. The, so you avoid the question like you only get a, a geographically necessary small school, I think is sort of what I'm mean, the context. So that's just the. Point the, mm -hmm. the next page is the further recommendations. So now we can get to the English language learners. Mm -hmm. um, and it, uh, it sounds like there's some questions on the table for uh, <coughs> um, almost perhaps re revisiting that testimony and under trying to understand how we have two estimates that are so different. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else on the English language? I think there's a lot on English language. To discuss more? Yeah. And then counting students living in poverty. We spent some time on that, but I think that was quite a while ago. Um, so it was a shift from the number of folks in a community who were enrolled in food stamps plus some other stuff. And then I'm using free and reduced lunch as the measure instead, and then a universal income declaration. Yeah. There, I would have to say, I ended up, we had some testimony on it, I think it was when we were listening to the child tax credit, and someone um, in state government who works on the SNAP program testified that the Enrollment in SNAP, there's some national award that they won for enrolling people in SNAP so well in Vermont. So I guess I I just I want to hear what other reason there would be to ex expand it to free and reduce price lunch enrollment, and then to understand the difficulty that I read um, that Winooski would have. I can't remember where I read this but they would have difficulty with how they get the children, um, how they get them signed up for free and reduced lunch because they have some difficulties there. So I would have to know if we were going to go from SNAP, which is something that is a that exists, you are or not in SNAP, and that's an unknown, 
to something that's free and reduced price lunch enrollment, then how do we fix the way that, how do we help the school districts help families to make sure that everybody who should be signed up for free and reduced lunch is so that kids are not left out. So, you know, either we do something that we already have the data for, or we have to figure out, I think, how we make this expansion work. Thank you, Carol. We can get more testimony on that. The universal income declaration form is sort of the solution to that. And that's what Winooski uses, Brattleboro uses. They're already sort of using that form, but we will get some really good. Ah, okay. George. Using the SNAP was a disaster for certain districts because we had an entire town, the town of Richmond which according to the human services folks, and you can never get the right person to tell you anything from human services. I tried for weeks to get that information from them, but they had the entire town of Richmond without a single person being counted. Now that's absurd. Um, and we had a town of um, Underhill with I think three people being counted, something that was single digits, whatever it was. Uh, because the, the, and you just can't find anybody to tell you why that is. It, it was extremely hard to get that information, but it was clearly not a system that was working adequately. So we, we, we need to go to something different. I think the free and reduced lunch is a, is a really good plan. Jim, and then. Yeah, briefly, um, Carol, you're right. Getting an accurate count is very important. But I think at the end of the day, parents bear some responsibility here. I mean, it's their, if uh, you roll your kids properly, uh, there's some an, uh, anonymity within the school. You know, I don't know whose kids are da da da. So um, no system is perfect, but I agree with George for a number of reasons and others that uh, free and reduced lunch will be a more accurate way until we can go to a Universal Declaration form. Well, did you ever build up? Did I post me? No, Scott did. Okay, Scott. I just throw. Out, we took the task force took testimony on SNAP, and the um, the the SNAP uptake rate varies dramatically across the state for a variety of different reasons. But it it, it, it they know that the uptake rate is not consistent across the state. So there's a suggestion in Montpelier this year that we go to universal free lunch. Mm -hmm. What's that going to do with this? So the way um, it's been discussed, so there's a number of districts around the state, um, Burlington, Winooski, Brattleboro. Do you have a district with that already do universal meals? Um, St. Johnsbury does. St. Johnsbury does. And so what those districts use is this universal income declaration okay. form. And then there's other districts in the state that are still doing free and reduced lunch and some kids have to pay and they use the free and reduced lunch form. Um, but the, anyone who fills any of the districts that use the universal income declaration form, that's then reported to the feds as free and reduced lunch numbers because we still have to report to the feds on that number. And so the idea would just be that everyone in the state would be using the same form, um, the universal income declaration form, instead of some towns using one and some towns using the other, but all the numbers being sort of reported the same. Okay. So it's all uniform. Yeah. 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 I was just going to add, I don't know, Bill, if it's helpful, but it's, you hit, I believe, 50%. If you have 50% of students in a district that would qualify, the federal government historically has been picked up the tab essentially for a universal meals program. Um, and that's been different in COVID, but that's that's kind of the dining room. And Hunger Free Vermont does a great job of sort of explaining the uptake rate at the different with the different forms and the different um, programs. So small school and merger support grants. Um, The idea is moving from the grants to the weights for small schools, but keeping all the merger support grants that were sort of part of various iterations of Act 46 and after. Yeah. I wouldn't want to take away anything that was promised 
uh, as far as merger support grants, but I do wonder what the dollar impact is. I remember it we being low. Hear, we could get some. Yes, but yeah. we can that get the actual number. It's phasing out, right? There aren't fewer fewer it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Some, some of them, some of them are not phasing out, though. Some of them are not. Some of them are, are forever. forever. We'll grab that number for you. Yeah, yeah I, and I think maybe not just a number, but how how does it affect individual tax rates? Where it where it would be maintained? Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry. I, is it that there are some small school merger grants that never, never, did you say ever go away? Merger support. No, not, yeah, so not the small school grants, but merger support grants, which may be the same thing, actually. I, I'm not sure you can explain that. I don't know. I'm glad you're included. Do you want it? No. So, and then last year we passed something that sort of added a third new category i remember yes. that yeah but so but but i thought that the merger support grants were to help i, I think i'm forgetting what they were but it was to get to as part of act 46 to help schools and to give them extra incentives to merge or help to merge and then after a while they didn't go away they just keep going i will flag that as something okay to talk i just more about yeah that folks want to understand better. Okay. Um, we are going to talk about transition mechanisms more because seeing that modeled out, is there anything we talked about that last week? Are there particular things about thinking about transition mechanisms that are jumping out for people? Can I think that uh, the transition timeline should be at least as fast and maybe a little faster than the Act 173 timeline that's on the books, which is a five year. You know, I, I'm not sure whether this life app will start by then, but I, I do think that that's a good thing to look at, kind of because there's a big change that we have established the Black Path for. I also think that I hope that maybe something on like a three year time frame or something might might work. So I, I would say looking at that as a template at least to get a good reference. And then I personally would like to see us go with the most aggressive timeline that seems practicable, especially since we might be doing some tax impact mitigation with some surplus. And I think that a shorter time frame to count on that surplus is probably wise. Um, so those are my thoughts about the transition. <laughs> So I think last week I asked if anyone sort of had thoughts about a reasonable percentage change in order to sort of gear, game out the number of years. Does anyone have any questions that would be helpful to answer to even think about that? So yeah. one question. Yeah. Are you talking about a percentage change year on year change of tax rate that yes. we would be looking for as a sort of maximum acceptable year on year change? Yeah. So I, I, I'm just thinking a little bit. I'm thinking out loud. <laughs> thinking That's what we're doing that. here. The, um, having a long transition that's reflected in uh, tax rate uh, adjustments at some point really disconnects people from the decisions that they're making it, it you know mm -hmm. we we did that we've been still carrying the f46 incentives and there's always this uh you know you get uh some explanation of something and then there's a footnote but you know these are all actually not real <laughs> um, and i worry about that a bit we did that with the phantom students you know we had we had an equalized student count, but we had phantom students and we always had to explain them away. And so I'm, I'm just expressing some concern about having um, tax, actual tax rates that are, I don't know which ones are the real ones and which ones are the not real ones, but having sort of uh, two sets of books. But is that the right way to describe it? Um, and for a year or two, that's probably fine. I would really worry about doing that for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. because because the world will shift 
and and we'll we'll be still dealing with um, with the two sets of books that are going to start being wildly different. Yeah, the part what I think about in that context is that if we're sort of building out a model to make that work based on what education spending or spending on education is right now, in like you said, in four years, it'll be so far away from whatever model we modeled that it will be meaningless too. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's only saying that I, I'm not sure how to do the transition, but I don't think that an adjustment in the tax rates is, if it's over five years, I think, I think it's somehow a problem. I just don't, I don't know a better way, but I throw it out as an issue. I think you're entirely right. When we present things to you, we're all presenting, we're using FY20 yeah. data, and we will show you, like we can transition them in and show you whatever it is, but that's in that stagnant year, and you're entirely right. And we'll be actually spending different amounts in the future for many good reasons. Um, and you also want to make it administratively easy. The agency of ed is going to have to figure out what that, and so um, it's, it's easy for us to say, oh, this town one gone up, I don't know, 50 cents, and so you're going to make them go up 10 cents a year, whatever it is. And so, but it actually gets hot. We have to figure out how you set it up so they can administer it. And it's pretty easy and clear. It, it, it's actually sort of a variation of the difficulty of explaining the CLA, you know, the, mm -hmm. that people right. think they're voting on something. So I could just imagine a few years down the road and the school board trying to explain this is what your budget is, but actually, it, and this is the tax rate it should get to, but actually the one it's going to get to is this over here. Um, and I just, I, I worry about it. George? Um, on, the, on the other hand, this is going to be a very big tax increase for some districts. And dumping that on people all at once could be a, a just a, a reason to fail a whole lot of you know, uh, failed budgets in in those particular those particular towns, or it's going to lead to cuts in, in some services there because it is really substantial. So I think we need to be very thoughtful and careful here about about this, and need to look carefully at the numbers and the the increased tax rates that this is going to cause for some people. Yeah. So I want to be clear. I think there does need to be a transition. I'm just I'm just worried about how we set it up and that it needs to be done in a way that mm -hmm. um, keeps people anchored in reality. And I think there's this anchoring in reality factor that needs to, is really important. And there's the not crashing any school systems during a very difficult time in people's lives. And that's part of what we're flexing. Kim? Yeah, I just thought maybe some testimony could be helpful. I'm thinking of the Act 173 thing again, I know this is different, but it has a sort of tail year and part of that has to do with the maintenance of effort around federal special ed rules and you don't mm -hmm. want it to like go down anyway it's complicated but i think some technical weighing in on whether they're i understand this is not related to special ed so there may not be federal pitfalls to be aware of but i do think some some technical um testimony to that effect of what do we need to be looking out for in this transition so that so that so that you know, are there, are there kind of um, federal agency of education that have rules to be, you know, sidestepped in the way that we are with that tail on the 173 slide path? And are you also asking if maybe maintenance of effort provisions might be a helpful piece of the mechanisms to float into this as well? Maybe, or, or really just to kind of have somebody flag whether uh, a cost adjustment pertaining to these uh, categories of need uh, would flag something such as maintenance of effort uh, on the special ed side. It would be different, but, but just understanding if there is some sort of state federal uh, interplay there that would, that would need to inform that mechanism. Anything else on the transition? Testimony, recommendations, anything? Okay. Um, so the next two on the list are Education Tax Advisory Committee and the Comprehensive Evaluation Mechanism. Those are both really fleshed out in the bill that the Senate's working on. And so I think it might just be helpful to wait for them to send over their fleshed out words and figure that out from there. So, and then we know we're going to talk more about a unified income-based taxation system for K-12 education funding um, right after this conversation. 
So then in additional recommendations, which is slide five. As opposed to further recommendations. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty silly. I cut, out, <laughs> I cut out some slides, and so I think the titles get sillier from there. I think they might have made more sense when there are more slides between them. Thank you. Do you want slide five then? Yeah. Okay. Additional recommendations. Yep. Okay. Um, so monitoring the implementation of Act 173 special education block grants, which seem to be actively moving right now. Um, I think what's helpful for me to understand is that as we're just modeling out transitions is making sure we're layering in the 173 money and the ESSER money and that we're getting a full picture of what a district's budget looks like from all of the different sources um, that are rapidly changing. Yeah. Is it possible to create a little simple chart, nothing simple, but we have these cost equity or weights or something like that. And we have transition money in some form and 173 money. It would be nice to just sort of be able to visualize how they intersect mm -hmm. interact. And I don't know who would do that, but, um, I tend to look at things visually to try to figure them out. So, uh, are, are, do you mind my asking? Are you looking for uh, you looking for, like to see in towns? Or tell me what. Tell me what your general broad categories. Just like what 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 act one seventy three money is doing to, to yeah. okay. Um, if that if that's something your office could do, it would be very helpful if you can. Um, if adding examples would help us understand, um, and that would be even more helpful. Thank you. So at the end of one of our conversations, we sort of came back to this, maybe it was you, Janet, I'm not sure. We came back to this core idea that we're doing all of this conversation about dollars and taxes towards the idea of creating educational equity for outcomes that all kids would actually get the educational, get their educational needs met and have the opportunities they would have. Um, but we don't spend that much time talking about it because we're ways and means and not the education committee. But that is sort of, that is why we're hypothetically doing all of this, right? Um, and so the education quality standards process and oversight is part of the bill that will come over. Um, it's definitely way more education than ours. Yeah. Um, I'll just add it's critically important. <laughs> we do not have a system right now in this state where the agency of education is actually getting out there and ensuring that our public schools are providing an excellent education to our kids. No matter what we do with education finance, if we don't do that, that doesn't even matter. And I guess I would ask the question as a follow on to that, are there other other pieces, for me, that's where the sort of, if we don't do this, then none of the rest of it matters fits. But are there other things like that that people want to sort of better understand in terms of um, outcomes for kids and why we are taking apart the entire education finance system and putting it back together um, that would be helpful anchoring for this? So the next additional recommendation is property having property tax credits correspond with current year tax bills. I think that idea has been sort of set aside a little bit with the focus on moving to the income-based system. Um, and I imagine has been talked about hundreds of times before in this room. Thank you. <laughs> 
At least 50. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my temptation is to just sort of leave that aside for a while and see if it's helpful to bring that conversation back in later on. Does that work for people? Sure. Yeah. Sorry, which conversation? Um, about having property tax credits corresponding with current year tax bills instead of past year tax bills. So there's no pre changes in the pre K weight recommended from Professor Colby's study. And so because of that, the task force did not recommend any changes to the weight. The reason Professor Colby's team did not recommend any changes to the weight is because no one asked them to look at any changes to the weight. And so it's just a funny thing that sits there and sort of causes a little bit of mess on the edges. Um, and so we just recommended that it gets folded into the really big um, Act 45 child care financing study that's gonna happen this summer and don't wanna open up that Pandora's box since someone's about to spend an enormous amount of time and energy focusing on that question. So can you sum that up for one more second? Cause I lost. So there's a pre-K weight in right. the current law and the study didn't recommend a change to the pre-K weight and we didn't recommend this change to the pre-K weight, not because it shouldn't be changed, but just because of momentum around how contracts with Professor Colby's team were drafted, to be perfectly honest, I think. And so we're just gonna set that question aside and punt it over to the Act 45 Child Care Financing Study. Caleb. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, okay. the point four six. for anybody who hasn't, and a lot of time we have the committee room around this otherwise, but point four six came significantly later than all the other weights that came following, I think it was Act 66 that instituted the pre-K program, I might have that number wrong, but that number, that 0.46 was really, as I understand it, was a number deemed high enough to incent public school districts to operate these programs. Um, and actually they've been beneficial to school districts in the sense that a lot of them don't operate these programs but they pay $3,500 a year to somebody else and for $3,500 a year, 0.46 EQP is a slam and deal. So <laughs> if, if, yeah, if you're short on pupils. Yeah. So I just throw that out as a little context. It is a more recent number and is a number that was not really empirically derived, but was sort of come up with as a way of what is a sufficient number to incent public school districts to take part in this public private hybrid program. So it's an interesting note. I think adding it to the Act 45 said it's a great idea. I'm just putting that out there because it's always going on my head. Yeah, so this is who will who will uh, decide who does that study? I think so. We have an RFP out right now. It's actually posted. We're hoping to actually have a. I think the bids are due next week. On it, this is the Act 45, and the report is due in December. That's what I was just looking at. So um, we should know more. Uh, weeks about who's doing the work. I wonder if, so it's one RFP, I'm thinking that the child care financing is kind of one kind of thing that has to be done. And then if you want the weights to be in line with the kind of research that was done by Tammy Colby, you would have the weights done by her again. So they're consistently derived. I think the study could recommend that we ask her, her team to derive a weight for pre-K. It might, the study might also mm -hmm. recommend that there shouldn't be any weight for pre-K and we should fund all pre-K a totally different way. I have no idea. Um, I'll just, yeah. I think this is exactly, to send it to a study is exactly what we want to do. I mean, we, I, I joined House Ed after they passed this bill and we tried for four years to fix it and move it around. And it was just like, I mean, you talk about impossible and a lot of it comes down to, it's just, you've got two different agencies here, AOE and AHS. <laughs> they, they couldn't even get in the same sandbox, much less play. I mean, it, was, it was brutal. 
word bifurcated comes up a lot. Yeah, it, yeah. Was, it, was, it was absolutely brutal. <laughs> My understanding is that that relationship has improved somewhat. In I hope so. Years, but yes, yeah, it's wild. Okay, so that study will handle that piece. Um, and then we've talked about school facilities a little bit, but that's also a separate conversation. Um, the task force talked about an early college program fractional weight. That is not something that we designed anything to do anything with. I guess I would just sort of ask folks on the committee if that's like a project you want to take up for the next five years of your life, please do so. <laughs> yes. I, I don't see why it has to take up five years of my life. So. <laughs> I'm willing to take it on because I think it's yeah. uh, a lot. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it is significant. It's um, it, it ought to be done. I don't think it takes five years. No, okay. I thought you were. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you were. No, I, 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 I wouldn't dismiss it. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be dismissive about it. I meant to say it's well, no. we didn't do any work on it, yeah. and someone needs to do work on it. Do you, um, yeah, we can talk later about it. But unless you think that there are you know obvious particular hurdles or challenges that we could all yeah. be thinking about, none jump out to me beyond just that some attention needs to be paid to it. And similar to the CTE conversation, we wind up in a disincentive, over incentive. How do we find that balance yeah. problem? Um, and probably the CTE conversation, which I think is yeah. going to be coming to us, and it's um, it could be folded into that conversation fairly effectively. Interesting parallel, and I'm thinking that the, the early college program, which I really don't know a whole lot about, seems to be successful in pulling students out of high schools and therefore out of the weight, you know, lose, losing that, losing the count uh, in a way that maybe CTEs aren't being successful. So mm -hmm. that might be informative to uh, dig into a bit. Yeah. Just adding on to the same early college CTE, we might look at homeschool fractional weights. It's an interesting subject, but there's more people using you know, you can take courses at a high school mm -hmm. because you're homeschooled, and if you take enough, it adds up to a fractional weight, but it's really tiny. It's kind of like the amount of money somebody gets, it, their song gets played on Spotify, kind of tiny. It takes forever to add up. So somebody can take almost like a full course load, and it counts as like less than a tenth of it. So I just think it would be interesting to look at in a kind of post-COVID world where there's a different dynamic in the homeschool world, and maybe it fits into that whole one. And I know in my area, there's a lot of kids who take a few classes at the elementary school while they're homeschooling, and the school actually really encourages that. And I never right. thought that it might be because they're getting weight bits for it. Bit. Wait, wait, <laughs> bits. So I think there's going to be a CTE study coming to us soon, and um, thinking about how to include our early college and not my thing. Mental health and trauma informed instruction grant. I, um, that is fairly squarely in the ed committee's jurisdiction from my perspective, but I could absolutely be missing something. I'm happy to be disagreed with. Well, yeah. I mean, it, yes, if the content is mm -hmm. certainly the ed committee, but if, if it comes, if it's a, mandate or it comes out of the ed fund or mm -hmm. whatever yes. it is it's ours as well mm -hmm. so end up dealing with it. yeah george hi hi you know as i've said before having done a lot of work on adverse childhood experiences this to me is the elephant in the room mm -hmm. other than english language learners this is probably and more powerful than anything else on the list of, of stuff we're doing cost equity for. Um, and, you know, and so I, I really appreciate that the task force took testimony about, about this stuff and that, um, you know, that, that there's some consideration of, um, of moving forward or at least studying, uh, you know, the, the effects of of the adverse childhood experiences on um, 
uh, on kids' lack of educational success. So anyway, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think that those are all of the core recommendations. Um, there any, yeah, Catherine. I might take you yeah. to your very last slide. Thank you. Uh, I skimmed to the other ones, but the last slide, uh, I talked about pre-K, but the tuitioning. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Yes. Which slide is that? The very last one. Okay. You should look at the other ones to make sure I didn't miss it. But I think the other ones were all speaking to the individual things mm -hmm. we've already covered. But um, second bullet on the last slide is about tuitioning, which is uh, an issue that I think you all need to. I don't know what you've discussed about it yet. So. So we haven't discussed it at all, actually. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take a guess that most of the committee is probably not even familiar with mm -hmm. the, what average announced tuition is and how it mm -hmm. comes to be. And we probably need to understand what that is. Yeah. Okay. With that, I think it's time for us to take a 15 minute break. And thank you, everyone. Of course, if anything comes to your mind after.